are you? Morning, Sean. How are you? Not too bad. So, uh, as Paul knows, I'm a little bit giddy about this recording uh, because I actually get to use props uh, for the second half of the video. Uh, so, this is the one I've been most excited to record so far. Um, so, Paul, thanks again for doing this. We'll explain why I'm excited to do it in just a second. Uh, for the, and I want to thank you, those of you who are tuning in, whether it's your first time or you're an existing subscriber. Uh, welcome to Did You Know That? Question uh, mark. This is a channel I created so that I could post videos of conversations I have with people that I find interesting about interesting topics or with people I find annoying. And I just want to see if I'm right or if I'm not. But this video is all about recycling in New York City. Um, and the reason why this is a hot topic is because for full disclosure, I sit on the board of Paul's company and he will explain what he does in just a second. So those of you tuning in, um, as a reminder, my name is Sean O'Rourke. What I do when I'm not uh, interviewing people is I'm a cyber liability consultant, which means I prepare companies to be hacked after spending 20 years in IT, keeping the bad guys out, I now basically prepare businesses for when they get in. And Paul, why don't you tell the good folks what you do? So um, I work for a family owned recycling company in Queens, New York. We have a recycling facility in Brooklyn. Uh, we take in garbage, trash, landfill material, and other recyclable commodities that we separate <clears throat> for processing and we have a fleet of about 30 trucks that we send out in uh, on collection routes every day throughout Brooklyn, Queens, and Manhattan. Excellent. Now, why don't you tell people what the name of the company is? That's the cool part. <laughs> so it's Mr. T Carding. That's not, the name. Not the pity the fool, Mr. T. <laughs> Mr. T is my grandfather. We're a third generation uh, family owned business. So uh, Pop started it in 1947, correct? That's correct. So 73 years as of the recording of this video, almost 73 years as of yeah. the recording of this video. Yep. That's excellent. All right. So uh, I've sat on the board of Mr. T. Carding for two plus years, almost actually almost three years. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the conversations that we always have is around recycling because New York City has a fairly expansive recycling program, but whether or not it works sometimes is uh, questionable simply because a lot of people don't know what is and is not recycling or recyclable, excuse me. And what we're going to do in this video, the second half of it at least, is we're going to go through a lot of common items, which is why I'm recording this at home, because I have a bag full of props right here. And Paul, to the best of his knowledge, is going to tell us whether or not it's recyclable. Uh, and then hopefully you'll be able to use that as a guide to maybe spur you to go find out other items that are or are not recyclable. But before we get into that, let's talk about recycling and how the process works. So Paul, Mr. T, just to give everybody an idea, commercial uh, trash and recyclables, not residential. Residential in New York City is handled by the Department of Sanitation, but in general, how does the recycling process work in New York City? Uh, <clears throat> well, by the way, we do we do supplemental service for New York City residents. That is true. So in, in certain areas that the city only provides a limited amount of days for service, um, individual homeowners or even um, apartment buildings can contact us for a supplemental service, which would be the third or fourth or whatever day they need for the for the building. So New York City, they actually just cut back their organics program due to COVID, and I guess the funds aren't there. But generally, Can the you city know residents. What, what constitutes organics? Just so uh, organic ways would be any food scraps. Okay. So if you think about like your simple dinner, you're sitting down eating dinner, and you finish with your meal. Any food scraps other than. Um, like fish bones and meat bones and things like that. They really don't want the bones, but all the food scraps themselves, even the peel you can put in there. You just don't want to mix any non organic materials in there. 
like napkins and forks and knives, uh, cups. A lot of times people do the one scrape scoop right into the compost bin and the end, uh, the end users don't like that, so. Yeah. So, but when it comes to recycling plastics, aluminums, metals, and what have you, how's that process work? Um, there's a different classification. There are seven to be exact different types of plastics. And when people in the recycling business refer to the different recyclable grades, they'll call them one through sevens, which is everything. Ideally, as, as a MRF, uh, as, as the, the building that receives the material from the collection routes, we would love to have seven different trucks come with seven different grades of plastic. Mm -hmm. But realistically, no one's going to do that. So they'll put all the plastics together in one bag. Um, <clears throat> they're supposed to have all their fiber, like for our company, which we handle commercial waste, We'll tell the customers to put it out in what's called a single stream. Um, and it's, it's either a single stream or a dual stream. A dual stream would be you're sending two separate trucks out or a truck that has a split hopper where you can put the materials in one side or the other side and separate them. Sure. But for the purposes of this conversation, we, we do single stream collection. Ideally, customers are supposed to put out all the fiber tied up with string like paper, cardboard, things like that. And then all their, um, call it MGP, metal glass plastic, would be in a clear or blue bag. So whoever's picking it up can see what's in it. When it gets to the facility, we can pull that bag off the line. Um, we will separate it. Our, our business focuses mostly on the fiber, which is the, the cardboard and the paper. Uh, we do a little bit of plastics, like rigid plastics. But for the for most of the small uh, plastic, which is the, the plastic bottles and probably some of the props you have, mm -hmm. they'll all get put together in a bag. We'll send it to a facility that specializes in separating all the different grades of plastic. Um, for instance, like Sims Recycling or Empire State Recycling, they might have optical sorters in place that know the difference between a shampoo bottle and a pack of Tic Tacs. So. Okay, so when somebody is, let's say, at their office, again, since you're on commercial and they drink a Poland Spring bottle, and let's say they don't throw it in the recycling bin, but they throw it in the trash, there's a word that has become very, uh, I don't know if popular is the right word, but oft used in the recycling business called contamination. And so can you explain what contamination means and why throwing your plastics or your your fiber or other recyclable items in a trash bin is a bad deal or throwing trash in the recycling bin is even worse. Well, throwing recyclables in a trash bin is bad because ultimately it's going to end up at the landfill. So there are materials that can be recycled if you dispose of them properly. Right. Um, but if you just mix it with the trash, even the best technology in the world might not help you separate that recyclable uh, piece of plastic from the trash. And at the same time, you might contaminate that good recyclable material with food waste or something that just makes it uh, uh, much harder to recycle. And on the other hand, putting everything out in a recyclable pile, it's another term it's been a lot more popular lately. It's called wish cycling, where people throw everything in a clear bag and say, oh, this is recyclable. They'll take a, I have a prop too, by the way. It's a <laughs> coffee go. cup. And you've got here, you know, the, I don't know if you can see it, the cardboard, yeah. the plastic, and then inside there's whatever coffee residue is left. That's wish cycling because that's going to go to the landfill. It's just, it's too contaminated to try and separate the lid from the cup from the coffee and it'll contaminate everything else. And by the way, if, if people don't know what Paul's background is, it's a scene from the office, the, the US version of the, the office. <laughs> so on wish cycling, uh, that's obviously everybody hoping that they throw stuff in recycling and then it'll get taken care of. But by doing that, they may actually 
make it so that all the recyclable, real recyclable items actually wind up in the landfill because they've been contaminated by something that is not recyclable, correct? Correct. And how often do you think that happens nowadays? Every day. Every all day. day, every day. Okay. So you could, you could have a perfectly good bag with one through sevens and somebody throws coffee grinds in there or somebody throws their, you know, the scraps from their lunch in there. And anyone who's on the line will see like food waste all over the inside of the bag. And they'll just pull it off and put it in the, the landfill pile because it's just, uh, the, you know, There's to no open to clean up the up. bag and try and wash every piece off yeah. is a bit of an inconvenience. And not cost effective because recycling to work, there has to be a market for the materials. Uh, people actually have to buy the recyclable materials from you or other um, locations, and they're not going to do that if the items that they're buying is are going to cost them more to clean up to make them recyclable, correct? Correct. So years ago, just focusing on like the, the cardboard or fiber, there was a much higher tolerance for contamination. So, I mean, over the years, it went from like 20% to 15% to 10%, all the way down to half a percent contamination now, which is very, very difficult to do. Um, there are big, big facilities outside of uh, the New York City area that have managed to get it down to half a percent, but it really takes a large amount of participation from the source, which is who's throwing it out. You know, once the collection vehicle gets there, it's, it's like they don't know what's in the bag. They're going to take it and make a decision which truck to put it in. Right. But I think the public, and by public I mean residential accounts and commercial accounts, I think the public just either doesn't know enough about how to recycle properly, or maybe it's just too much of a, an inconvenience for them, so they just kind of wish cycle it. And so when it comes to that, the source is obviously the first step in there because the cleaner that they can keep it, the better uh, chance it'll be that it'll actually wind up being recycled. Um, but the fiber that you talk about, which is cardboard and, and paper and whatnot, but not all fiber is created equal because there are certain types of cardboard that a lot of people think are recyclable, but aren't because either they have uh, remnants of food or they're waxed or there's a finish on it, correct? Correct. So if you think about, you know, maybe a, a box that, that has like a coating on the outside, like a, a sheen to it or, or, or you know, uh, an embossed label or something, it might be, if you tear a cross section of it and you look in the end, users say, well, it's not the fiber we're looking for you know, it'd be considered trash only because unless you have enough of it to find, uh, to, to make a, a finished bailed product and then find someone who wants to buy it from you and recycle it, it's just never going to move. So let's say grocery stores or places like Costco or Walmart or what have you, that get these large shipments in on these pallets and these large boxes. A lot of times the boxes that you're pulling out of Costco to put all your large items in, since those have a sheen or a wax finish on them, they're not going to be recyclable, correct? Correct. <clears throat> the Most of the fiber we send out are OCC, which stands for old corrugated containers. They don't want to see wax cardboard in there. Years ago, I did hear of a company out west that was using wax cardboard to make logs, like those Duralogs that, or something like that that you'd burn in your fireplace. Oh, nice. But I don't, I don't think they needed all of the wax cardboard that the United States produced. So there are people that will recycle. They will buy and recycle the wax cardboard, but the market is spotty. So um, we used to bail it and then it's, it would just sit around for a while. There, was, there were times when there was a hot market and people wanted to buy it and recycle it. But unless you can keep moving the product over and over again, I mean, Real estate in New York City here, it's like, it's pretty sparse. So mm -hmm. 
unless you have a large warehouse facility to store all this material, it, it's better to just keep it moving as it comes in. Right, because in, in New York City, at least, there are limitations to how long you can hold materials in your facilities, right? Um, or yes is that just based on, on the geography of your facility? At some point, you, you quickly well, max it out and you got to go. Yeah, I mean, there are, there are large facilities out, out west that will they'll keep the product for a while and they'll wait for the market to improve. <clears throat> it's like a double-edged sword. It could go one way, it could go the other way. If you, sure. if you hit the market right, like let's say, giving you round numbers, let's say cardboard is selling for $100 a ton and you think it's going to go up. You could stockpile this stuff and then when you have enough of it, try and sell like a bulk supply and get just one uh, um, purchase order for maybe 10 or $20 higher than that. But at the same time, you don't know what the, the world markets or even the domestic markets are going to do. So you could stockpile it and get to the point where it's, it's on a decline and you might take a loss because you paid more for it. And at the same time, with something like cardboard corrugated, I mean, look, it is a fire hazard because it's, uh, it's flammable. So if you research online uh, MRFs or fire at MRFs, material recovery facilities, almost everyone has had a fire before. Uh, a lot of times people throw a lithium battery in there and all it does is mix with the cardboard and start the fire. So you don't want to stockpile too much of this product. Um, also, in regards to the trash, you do have to move that within 48 hours. That's a DEC reg. And the DEC stands for? Department of Environmental Conservation. And that's New York City based. So Yeah, so in New York City, you have to have, um, to have a transfer station, you need two permits, a DEC permit and a DSNY permit. That's Department of Sanitation. And um, they, they state your regulations, how many tons a day you're allowed to take in, the loose garbage that people dump has to be off the floor within 24 hours. And if you bail it and store it, you, you're allowed to keep it up to 48 hours, so. But you have to get it out within 48 hours. Yeah, in, in regards to the other bailed materials like the paper, the plastic and whatnot, there's no limit on how long you can keep it. But um, just to give you an idea, if I take a nice, <laughs> bright bale of cardboard, you know, compacted uh, cardboard or even paper. And I let it sit in a facility that's, you know, got a constant air exchange with, you know, dust and other particular matter. Um, you let it sit there long enough, a nice, a nice bright bale of paper doesn't look nice and bright anymore. It looks really dirty. So it's like snow in New York City. Uh, it looks really good until they yeah. start plowing and then it yeah. turns gray and ugly. So you've got a short window for it. So you've mentioned, yeah. mentioned the term markets uh, and the people who actually buy recycled material. Who typically makes up those markets? Who's buying these materials? Uh, it used to be China. China was like the biggest buyer of all the fiber and um, even plastics. But a couple of years ago, they, 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 their regulations went into effect. China, basically, the whole world was sending them a very highly contaminated product. And they said, enough is enough. So that's when you get that half a percent contamination um, in effect. And it kind of cut off the end market for a lot of people because they just couldn't get the, the product that clean. So they started looking at Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam, those seem to be the, the big three right now who are, who are buying the product. For a time, the domestic markets got big, um, and those would be, you know, out in the Midwest, uh, even down south a little bit in Virginia. But uh, it, 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 I haven't seen the domestic markets consistent yet. I think it is coming. It's just... Is it coming yet? Is it a matter of it's not cost effective for them to purchase recycled materials or is it they just have no use for it? Um, no, there's always a use for it. So it's no secret that in, in China, you know, the, the cost of labor is much less. 
-hmm. So if you take that number of $100 a ton, just a round number, that I would get for my bailed cardboard, I'm not going to get that much domestic because um, even though I'll save a little bit of money on, on what it costs to ship, I'm not going overseas because the labor rates in the United States are much higher right. uh, than in China. It's, you're always going to get a little bit less than in a domestic market. So. so that means it's got to be, I mean, it's just like any other business. Recyclables require a seller, which is the source, uh, people who are giving it away or throwing it away, I should say, but there also has to be a buyer on the other side. And when there's no buyer, <clears throat> that means there's no market for you guys or for other people. Yeah, usually, and, and a good gauge <laughs> is when the price of cardboard goes up, there's, a, there's actually theft of cardboard. People will rent box trucks, vans, and whatnot. They don't go around to every little piece of cardboard you see. They know where the big accounts are, like the supermarkets who put out 20 or 30 bales of cardboard. And before our drivers and helpers get there, they're gone. So, so all of a sudden, you've sent drivers and helpers out. You've got nothing to pick up. Yeah, I sent my partners um, an email article last week on cardboard theft. And when you got halfway through the article, you saw this was this article took place in Spain. Uh -huh. Which means that, you know, this was, this was a worldwide thing. When the price of cardboard is up, everyone's stealing it. And then when the price of cardboard drops, which was probably right before uh, the coronavirus hit, you saw just an overabundance of cardboard out there. So as of the recording of this in August 2020, how's the recyclable market look from your perspective? Uh, it's really, really tough to tell because... The schools aren't opening in full capacity. Offices are closed. So the demand for paper and cardboard isn't really there yet. I mean, you can imagine all the paper. Look at Manhattan. How many of the office buildings are vacant? People are working remotely. You know, so in regards to Dunder Mifflin, <laughs> they'd be hurting right now in the right. paper market. So no paper products, nobody's printing anything, everything's electronically done. Even all the orders from Amazon and from other delivery services can't compensate for the loss of the everyday that you get out of the commercial space, right? Yeah, and, and a, large, a large portion of our business, not just our company, all the other companies, are restaurants, catering halls, and, you know, due to the coronavirus and the regulations in New York, a lot of them just aren't open yet. Some of them may, may never open again. Sure. So the, you know, the, the gross product that we were picking up, those quantities just aren't there right now. Gotcha. Well, I think, okay, that's enough for the preliminaries. Uh, now we get to the, the main event. And this is, this is <laughs> where you get to, uh, to show off a little bit for the viewers. I'm going to start pulling stuff out of this bag that I have here. And Paul has seen some of this before and he hasn't seen some others because I went and got more things out of here. Uh, some of these will be easy and some of them, a lot of people are going to question and hopefully you'll be able to explain why it is and is not recyclable uh, or what you will have to do to make it recyclable. So I'm gonna start with an easy one first, plastic clamshell that contained, what do we have in here? Strawberries. Uh, so there, there are people that will recycle it if you have enough of it. Um, as a mixed plastic, it's probably not recyclable. If you're a New York City resident and the city of New York is picking you up, it's probably going to go to a recycling facility that can separate that, that grade of plastic by itself. You just want to make sure you wash it up because yeah, if so there's, yeah, if there's strawberries it. in there or there's any residue in there, or especially the diaper, that's what they call the little foam so pad that they put this, on the bottom. Yeah. Raspberries. Yeah. I left it as is because of the bottom. And that's what you refer to as the diaper, which are those yeah. pads on the bottom. So right. I need to remove those, clean this out, and then I can throw it in the recyclable with 90% assurance that it will reach a recycling facility. Yeah. Okay. 
So two down. I'm good so far. All right. Every day, carton of eggs, but this is styrofoam. This is not the, the sort of the paperish one. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's considered, you know, I think it's not number uh, uh, six polystyrene. There yeah, are, I'm not sure where the number would be on this. Yeah, it's, it's a styrofoam. I mean, there, when I was out west touring MRFs, there are, there are companies that will take styrofoam, e even that, and they'll, you have to have enough of all the same quantity to make it worthwhile. So the reality is, at least in the New York City area, that egg carton is not getting recycled. That's going to the landfill. So, it, all right, so let's stop there real quick. If you take this and I throw it in the plastic recycling, because I know it's not paper, will, do you think New York City will separate it out and keep I the other stuff? I can't speak for New York City, but my opinion is it'll end up in the landfill. Okay, so styrofoam, just to be safe is better to throw out than to put in your recyclables. Yeah, there's there's also really not a market for it. Okay. I mean, the, the companies I saw West that were recycling it, they would shred it up, compress it again, and they'd make these like big bricks out of it. And there was a time when companies like Home Depot were buying them and they would use them as building materials, but it was a net zero at the end of the day. Nobody made any money doing it. It was just yeah. really because it looked good. Gotcha, okay. Now we get to a little bit of a curveball. Chicken stock. It's got a plastic cap and and nozzle, but it feels like cardboard. It's not cardboard. I can assure you of that. Um, it's 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 a coated. It's considered a grade of coated paper. Maybe even like a. Might have some plastic mix in there, depending on what's in on the inside. A lot, oftentimes, they'll use a liner. You'll see that on protein shakes and whatnot. And that plastic liner, the the, it'll just interfere with what paper or fiber is in there. So throw it into trash. Yes, it is lined. Yeah, I would throw that in the trash. You throw this in the trash. Okay. Yeah. If you want, you can take the cap off and put it with your plastics. But again, so realistic. So, so let's say you do want to and you want to give whoever's picking it up the choice of whether or not this gets trashed or whatever. You would at least throw this in the plastics, not the cardboard. Uh, yeah, I would throw it in the plastics. I, I would put it in a bag with all the plastics. Okay. Chocolate milk, one of my favorite drinks. It's a, uh, it's a number one PT on the bottom. Everybody yep. should see where those numbers are. Plastic cap and what have you. Will this get recycled? Yes. Uh, it's a very good idea to cut the label off, though. Okay. It's very easy to take off. You just get yep. a scissor and snip it. So. Um, the label itself is garbage. All right. I'm not going to snip it on while we're, we're doing the video. Okay. So... My wife gave me this. It's a pump action hairspray. It's all so, plastic, but some of them are a metal as well. But this one happens to be plastic. So it would definitely go in that MGP bag. MGP stands for metal glass plastic. Um, that's a tough one because a lot of those hairsprays are flammable. And in the recycling business, we don't like anything flammable near paper, cardboard, plastic, because uh, fires can occur. So nine times out of 10, I would say before you throw that out, uh, rinse it out as good as you can. It's probably gonna end up in the trash because you've got the, the cap itself, it has a pump action. So there's two different kinds of plastic in there. There's a, a metal spring in there. I'm sorry, three kinds of plastic in there. And then the, the bottom itself, the bottle itself is considered like an HDPE, you know, a high density plastic. That probably can be recycled if you send it to a, uh, a recycling facility that has those optical sorters in place. Okay, so you would probably throw out the pump, clean the bottle, yeah, and throw the bottle and the cap in with plastics. Yeah. Okay. All right. I hope everybody is writing this down or you're going to have to watch the video again.
So this contained four razors. It's a hard molded plastic. Garbage. Garbage? Okay. Yeah, yeah I, the, the, the thing is that. That, that you try and uh, compact that, it's gonna shatter into a thousand little pieces this and it'll wind up in the, they call it the unders pile. And all the unders will wind up at a landfill, you know, as cover or something like that. Okay. Plastic container of drink mix. Again, probably just cut the label off and throw in plastic, right? Correct, correct. Okay. Would you separate the lid and the container or just can you leave them together? Doesn't matter, but definitely okay. I would take the label off. Okay. <clears throat> so we talked about this before with the, the hairspray, but this is very similar. It's a soap pump. You probably want us to clean it out, throw away the pump, and then cut the label or peel the label off because it's a sticker on this. Yeah, I mean, if you can, if it peels off easy, uh, great. Otherwise, I, I wouldn't lose sleep over it. I would throw it out, you know. Uh, so your best guess, if, if we leave this sticker on, would it eventually wind up in the trash or would somebody be able to take the molded plastic and do something? No, I think they would take the plastic and recycle it. Okay. All right. So... Uh, moving on. <clears throat> this one is, is new, and this one, I know glass is very hard to recycle at the moment because there's not a big market, but this one is an air freshener that you plug in. Plastic cap, plastic insert, the wick, and then this is all glass. Garbage. All of it garbage. Well, if you were going to separate everything except the glass and then you were going to take all your clear glass and brown glass and green glass and put it together, you could bring it to a glass recycle, uh, a recycler and they will recycle it. But the, even the glass recyclers, they, they're very, very strict in what they want. Yeah. Um, they don't want ceramics in there. They don't want vision wear in there, tempered glass, things like that. So would the Department of Sanitation pick this up and sort it out and throw it away? Or would they consider the bag contaminated if we threw this in there? Uh, well, they'll, they'll pick it up with, um, you know, what's in the recycling can. I think years ago, they used to separate the glass from the plastics. I think that didn't make financial sense to do anymore. So they just, they, they mix it all together. But once you put that in the truck and all the glass is compacted together, it's all going to break anyway. So... Realistically, it's going into the landfill. Realistically, okay. um, so, which is so which is, which is not detrimental, by the way. No one has shown that you know glass at the landfill. No glass. Yeah, glass will eventually yeah. disappear at some point. What if this was a Coke bottle? Uh, if it was a Coke bottle, like I said, you could. If it was strict glass, you could recycle it. Um, but I think the only way to really ensure that it will get the glass will get recycled is if it a goes through a redemption center uh, or, you know, you can go to your local supermarket and put it in, um, you know, if they have the machine that recycles the glass or even find a local glass recycler. I know there's one in Jamaica. I don't know if he'll take, um, you know, a door trade customers uh, dropping their glass off or not, but, you know, just throwing it outside with your trash. Realistically, the, the, the glass does not get recycled. So you see this in New York City a lot, is that people come, they know when recycling day is for these buildings, and they go through the recycles to find the items that are, have a redemptive value, either, either five or 10 cents. And then they take it to the supermarket or a Costco, and they throw it all in those recycle bins, and they get paid for how many bottles they bring. And if you're a fan of Seinfeld, you know Kramer and, and Newman had a scheme to do that in Michigan, and then it all blew up on them. So, yes, the, you can't make money off of glass, but it has to be the redemptive value glass. Um, this one, a bottle of honey with a little bit of honey still in it. I'd probably throw that in the trash, only because that honey is almost impossible to get out of there. All right, but if you can get it out. Uh, if you can get it out, it's, uh, you know, that is, uh, I think, a form of PET. I believe that's the number one. Yeah, it's the number one. 
Yeah, they'll they'll recycle that along with the Poland Spring bottles and what have you. Okay, but you got to clean it. You can't just yeah, throw it in there. Yeah, that's that's very very important. It's, you want to have those materials clean. Food waste is food waste. Right. Wire hanger. Recyclable. Recyclable. Okay. Or take it back to your dry cleaner and do them a favor. <laughs> Yeah, or you keep it and use it around the house when you drop, you know, something under the refrigerator. Right. Or if you watch Mommy Dearest. Yeah. Know, most people won't even know what that movie is. So. John Crawford. Yeah. Um, Amazon garbage. bubble package. That is garbage. Garbage. Yeah. So this is the one that always sort of gets me, but um, it's even still. Envelopes. But with the windows in them, you know, uh, with the little foil over the window, behind the window? Yeah, you know what, if you have, if you have a few envelopes with, uh, like if you had a whole truckload of envelopes with the plastic in it, eventually the, the product uh, being bailed up and to the end uh, user, they probably wouldn't like it very much, but um, for the most part, it would go in with a mixed paper you just want to make sure you don't take those FedEx envelopes, which is like a, almost like a burlap material. That is not paper. That's not fiber. You don't want to mix that. Even in. though it feels like it, it's yeah. not. Okay. So if you really want to make sure these get recycled and what not, take the plastic out of them and then recycle the paper. Yeah. I mean, look, it depends how much time you have. If you, if you're in the mood to take it out the little windows. It takes a couple of seconds to just take it <laughs> off. Come on. Okay. So here is what we were talking about. This is a to-go box. It housed delicious cookies that didn't last very long. It is cardboard-ish, but it's got a wax covering because of the regulations when it comes to how you can put food in cardboard and, and whatnot. This is garbage, right? Yes, correct. Because there's no way to separate that wax surface from the the fiber. Correct. Okay. Well, also, that's, that's not so disappointing. That's not considered um, old corrugated, uh, you know, cardboard. Right. Right. You know, if you if you tear that up, that's that's more of a chipboard than a cardboard. Okay. It is disappointing for people, but that's just the reality of the situation. Again, very common. Take out plastic container those are recyclable as long as you clean it right yes yeah, so correct i cleaned it and then i had my dog lick it that's how i cleaned it she she cleaned it the rest of it just a couple more items actually yeah we have a couple more here. this one postcard garbage garbage because it's it's considered a coated stock garbage. and even though no. it's real paper, it's coated, and which means you can't get any use out of it beyond that. However, no. this is recyclable, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, that looks coated also, but you, you know, you're really not going to have 5,000 5, of those. You're going to have one or two, and it's going to get mixed with the fiber or the mixed paper, and it'll get recycled. You're going to have 5,000 of these. These are one of the most popular brands of, of moisturizing cream on the market there. No, what I, what I mean is you from your house are not going to oh, be throwing out 5,000 yeah. of those. Yes, but cumulatively around the city, we will. Yeah, around okay. the city, I mean, there's really no way for me to separate that one kind of box from all the other cardboard. So right. it'll all get mixed in with the fiber and probably okay. bailed together. So this is garbage mm. because it's most likely lined. Correct. Okay. We talked about this. I wanted to bring this up. Protein scoop, protein powder scoop. It is recyclable. Okay. See, all the, the meat heads out there like us, we can recycle. <laughs> this is recyclable. I drop them. Correct. Oh, okay. I would just I make sure that I, I, you know, I squeeze all the contents out of it. And if possible, just snip the label off. Slip the label off. Okay. Uh, same way with this. This is butter extract. The only way this is recyclable is if I can get all the stuff out of it. Because it's plastic. Yeah. Yes. 
Okay. That, that, yeah, that'll probably get recycled too. Chinese takeout. Garbage. Well, I would definitely take the metal handle off and recycle that with the metal. Ah, there you go, folks. Take the metal off. That's actually recyclable. So if you're really serious about this, take the metal off. However, if you're eating out and what have you and you're in the park, there's no real metal recycling places around the park and whatnot. Okay, last thing. Good old paper bag. Recyclable. Don't have to take the handles off or anything. It's just no, I'd, I'd mix that right in with the cardboard. Okay, fair enough. Oh, last thing actually, my water bottle. Recyclable. I think that's uh, what is that number five? Mm, let me see. I don't know. I'd have to look. I don't have. I, I don't have enough light to see underneath it. Whatever. But yeah, those, you, those are the, the BPA free bottles. Um, yes, it is BPA free. That I knew. Yeah. Yeah. You you know you'd unscrew the top. The top obviously has. Uh, a little bit of rubber on it, um, probably uh, like a little gasket O-ring on the inside. Yeah. Um, so the, the lid would go in the trash, the bottle could go in plastics. Correct. Okay, fantastic. And I got myself all, all the, the remnants of the water just dripped all over me. There you go. <laughs> well, that's, oh, oh, last thing. Big peanut butter fan. Smucker's natural. Comes in glass with a whatever kind of metal lid. I'd have to make sure that that is perfectly clean, but I can put it in the recycles as glass. You, you can, and just being a realist, most times the peanut butter container uh, is gonna go in the trash because it's just so difficult to get all of the peanut butter uh, you have residue. You not seen me eat peanut butter there, my man. I have not, I have not. Yeah, so. But it, you have to clean it. Again, the source is the key. Yes. You can't be lazy about it. Okay. That's all I got. Um, yeah, okay. So I know you have a website. You sent me a website with basically a cheat sheet on it. And I'm going to include it in the video details below. I think everybody should go visit that and get an idea of what the reality of the situation is. You can't always be perfect on recycling. But I do think with a little bit of effort, we could be a lot better at it than we are. Yes? No? Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, look, I, I think I'm a big fan of uh, the aluminum pens. A lot of times the, the local deli or gourmet market I go to, if I'm going to get a prepared food, yeah. um, I would prefer, and, and look, I do have a little bit of a culinary background, but I would prefer to heat everything up in the toaster oven rather than the microwave. It just tastes better. A, you're only going to be able to heat up in the toaster oven in an aluminum pan. Right. B, they're reusable. You can use them over and over again. Um, and C, if it does really get caked in bed and, and you wanted to throw it out, you could throw it out with the metal. And they can take contaminated metal. Yeah, absolutely. Because, uh, I mean, look, if it's, if it's full of spaghetti, it's probably not. But a little bit of residual on the, on the aluminum. Uh, especially like soda cans, there's always going to be some kind of, um, yeah, there's always residual on the inside of those. But, you know, once they, um, they'll probably use an eddy current that'll separate like the, the high grade metals, the aluminum, the stainless, things like that. Yep. Um, then when they smelt it down and recycle it, it'll, it is recyclable. Yeah. I know there are no tours of MRFs usually, at least not in New York City. Uh, but I would highly recommend anybody who uh, has any questions about how the whole process works to kind of go behind the scenes because garbage is a, <clears throat> is a large undertaking. And for Mr. T to still be around 70 plus years later speaks one volumes to your family, but two to the, the fact that uh, you guys know how to get it done, especially in a place as complicated as New York City. I like to think so. <laughs> Especially since it now falls on you to get it done. Yeah. Well, okay. This probably, we might do this again if I can find more weird materials to, uh, to quiz Paul on. But uh, Paul, I really do have to thank you. I know you work 
very weird hours and to record at a reasonable time is, uh, is somewhat of a sacrifice. So I greatly appreciate it. Uh, and hopefully folks learned a thing or two about recycling and what is and is not recyclable. Any Great. parting shots or parting words or recommendations for folks? Uh, stay safe, wear a mask. <laughs> Fair Wash enough. Hands. Well, there you go. We're going to close it out with a COVID warning and, and entreaty. Uh, again, that is Paul Zambrata. He is uh, the recycling guru at Mr. T. Carding. I am Sean O'Rourke. This has been another episode of Did You Know That? If you liked it, please hit the subscribe button with the bell so that you get notified of future videos of which there will be many, hopefully, fingers crossed. Uh, but I wanna thank you again all for tuning in and I hope to see you next time. And Paul, I will see you at the next board meeting. All right, be well. All right, take care. Thanks.